All right. So we're going to kick things off here. It is 12.01. Your guys' time is valuable. Um, I want to make sure that we jump right in and get started. I want to encourage everyone uh, to not be checking your uh, latest sports team stats um, to give John your full undivided attention. I'm kind of kidding, um, but hopefully this is beneficial for you guys. Um, what I want to know before we uh, really kick things off is uh, where you guys are at with your Dynamo experience. Um, are you guys never heard of Dynamo, seasoned user? Um, are you, should you guys be teaching this stuff on this webinar right now? Like, where are you guys at right now with your Dynamo expertise? Just throw it in their chat window so we know where you guys are at. So, had a one-hour training. Still have no idea what I'm doing. Some people are playing with it, never used it. A little bit of knowledge, beginning user, novice. Tinkering for a couple of days now. It's good, never used it. Early starter, beginner, a little bit of knowledge. Um, just learned at AU, it's good. Eight hour class at AU. Trying to get there, get it going. A lot of beginners, this is good. Uh, yeah. Newbie, no experience, not you. So I'll defer to John, but I think this should be a good, a good session for you guys as an introduction to where Dynamo's at, um, where it's going. I want to introduce um, John Pearson. John Pearson is our computational event specialist at Evolve Lab. The guy is a stud. If you guys have not heard of him, check him out at Twitter. It's at 60 Second Revit. He's on Twitter there. So if anybody has Twitter, you guys want to do a little tweeting during the webinar, that's encouraged and welcome. Um, John also won the Dynamo Slam last year for AU. So I saw some of you guys attended AU. Um, John won the Dynamo Slam, a uh, very prestigious award there. He also has the uh, Rhythm package, which is one of the top ten most downloaded packages for the uh, Dynamo. And so definitely a uh, very seasoned uh, user within Dynamo. And we're super fortunate that John's uh, leading the discussion. Um, like I said, this is supposed to be interactive. So John's going to be showing some stuff. Um, we do have projected about 290 people that signed up for the webinar. Um, we're at right around 100 right now. Um, so we want to see a lot of chatter in, in there. At the same time, please recognize there's a lot of people in this webinar, um, so we may not be able to get to absolutely everyone, but we're going to try our best. Uh, this is also going to be recorded, and we're going to share it on our Evolve Lab membership site. So if you guys want to check that out, Check it out there at um, evolvedem.com. All right. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off over to John, and you can go ahead and start, John. Awesome. Thank you, Bill. All right. You're so welcome. welcome, everybody, to Lab Live, talking about some Dynamo player action today. Uh, so throw questions out there. Uh, Bill will jump in and fill me in on any questions anyone has. I like questions. I like helping people a lot. So... Um, anything that you have, just let me know or let Bill know through the chat window, and we'll um, we'll answer as soon as we can. Um, even after this webinar, we're happy to answer any questions. Uh, Dynamo is exciting. Dynamo Player is pretty new still and exciting, so just showing it to everyone is something I really like to do as well. So we should see a presentation on my screen. So this one is making the most out of Dynamo Player, of course. So we'll start out with a few slides, and then we'll jump into live demo. I typically like to do a lot, of, a lot of live demo during my presentations. So Bill already kind of covered this for me. I'm a computational design nut and BIM specialist at Evolve Lab. I blog about a lot of Dynamo and Revit stuff at my own blog, as well as the Evolve Lab blog. I'm on Twitter as at 60 Second Revit. Uh, jump on there and tag me or whatever if you want um, while this is going on. Uh, it could be kind of fun. Uh, they call it Twekling, because it's like heckling, I think. So it looks like we have quite a few beginners um, uh, in this webinar, which is great and awesome. I really like that a lot. Uh, this is geared more towards Dynamo Player. So what I'll do is I'll break down what Dynamo is a little bit first. Uh, Dynamo is a uh, it's a visual programming tool for for Revit and a whole infrastructure of other software as well. What it does is it lets you tap the Revit API 
and generate some awesome workflows and automate repetitive workflows and all kinds of stuff. It's really hard to sum up. But my favorite thing about Dynamo probably is it's a community. So on my screen, I open the Dynamo forum. So what, what Dynamo represents even beyond a software or anything like that is a community of people willing to collaborate and help each other. I'm always on the Dynamo forums. I saw a few comments about people like, oh, he helped me out on the forums, so that's awesome. Uh, Dynamo is a community. We're all here to help each other out and do some awesome stuff and, and do really cool things, honestly. So I'll jump back to the presentation. Present. So now, what is Dynamo Player? So basically, Dynamo Player turns boxes and wires, so typical Dynamo graphs, into something a little more a little more human, a little more understandable. So you could take a Dynamo graph, throw it into a directory, and turn it into this awesomeness I have on the screen right here. So you can turn it into something that is more intuitive for your end users. So a lot of the time people have problems with Dynamo because it's not something that everyone can open right away without a little bit of practice, but Dynamo Player really opens that up to everyone pretty well. One thing I really like about Dynamo is it supports Revit workflows. And with Dynamo Player, that's even better. So now we can start to support workflows in a familiar way that's adaptable and it's very intuitive. So one thing I'm going to get into is adding UI or user interfaces to Dynamo Player workflows, which isn't doable out of the box. Dynamo is also really cool because it makes Revit do things that Revit can't do on its own. So if you can't do it in Revit, you might be able to work it out in Dynamo or bring an external source in. So I really like Dynamo for that because it honestly, it just makes Revit better. Uh, who doesn't want that, right? So we're going to go over a few examples today. Uh, Bill mentioned it earlier, everyone's time is valuable, but I want to get you as much content as I can. So I prepared about three examples that I think are pretty key. I'm going to show the example right from Dynamo. Since we have a few beginners in the webinar, I want to do that and break down a Dynamo graph with everyone. So we're going to look at overriding keynote color by the source at which it came from. So if you've used Revit for any amount of time, you know that there's the ability to element keynote, material keynote, and user keynote items in Revit. Uh, that's a read-only parameter that we can't typically use. Uh, but Dynamo can, and it's pretty cool. So I'll show that. I'll show a way to override the interior elevations crop regions to frame our interior elevations on sheets. Uh, I've, sp I've spoke to a lot of interior, uh, interior designers and people who have to lay out interior sheets, and they like to frame their elevations. And the way they were doing it before was manual, and manual's not fun, because doing it manually means you're spending more time than you should, and that means you're spending more money than you should. So we can always make those workflows better. From there, we'll go turn around and we'll Dynamo playerify those workflows. So we'll turn them into a workflow that's very similar to Revit add-ins. That's really cool because it's pretty deployable and usable uh, across any user in your firm. And if there's time, I'm going to show a really cool randomized curtain grid workflow that I've briefly shown on my blog, but I haven't really spelled it out. So I really want to show that to everyone. Before I, Another thing I want to cover before I get started, so I mentioned Dynamo is a community, a really powerful community of users and contributors. So there's a lot of Dynamo workflows already made out there. There's a lot of Dynamo packages available. I listed a few here that I use all the time. Uh, there's more than I can list for sure, but these are some of my favorites. Uh, I also threw mine on there just because it's mine and I use it all the time too, right? So, um, You guys will get this data set too through our website, so you'll have all these resources available. Uh, there's some other resources, websites, so of course we have the forum I showed from Dynamo, so the Dynamo forum's great to ask questions on and get answers. The Dynamo pre, uh, primer or primer, as Colin McCrone says it, um, for, it's like the getting started with Dynamo. So it kind of, it primes you to do awesome things with Dynamo. Uh, DynamoBIM.org's the uh, core website. DynamoBuilds.com is where you download various versions depending on your version of Revit. So let's say you're still stuck in Revit 2013, you can go download it from DynamoBuilds.com, the compatible one. 
There's also a new one called dictionary.dynamobim.com, and what that's aiming to do is literally be a dictionary of Dynamo nodes and what the heck they do, which is pretty cool. So that's that's still fairly new since about AU this last year, so that one's building up as well. A similar one is dynamonodes.com, which was launched by the author of what Revit wants, Luke Johnson. Uh, that's for custom package authors to document their workflows, so I put my stuff on there as well. Once again, these links are going to be included for you to use. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll jump into the presentation, and then we'll jump back to these slides as well. So let me switch my screen. Cool. So everyone should see a desktop now, and I might see if Bill can verify that with everyone. Yeah, I see your desktop. Cool. Thank you. Uh, once again, if you guys have any questions, throw them in, and uh, Bill could jump in with the questions, and I'll answer them the best I can. Um, that way, we can help you guys out. So don't be afraid. Uh, we're willing to help out where we can. Let me drag this window out of my way. So what we're going to do is I'm working in Revit 2017 today. I'm going to go ahead and switch my attention this way, because that's where my main monitor is as well. So. <laughs> uh, I'm working in Revit 2017 today, and I have a few files open for my examples. So what I'll do is jump to my main file. I have Dynamo open already as well. But all this is is a Revit sample file on a detail view already set up for me. So in this detail view, we have some keynotes already placed as well. So this is a workflow I've seen needed a few times uh, at firms because user keynotes are kind of considered like bad almost, so we're able to isolate those really quickly. Uh, looking at this view right offhand, I don't know what a user keynote is and what an element keynote is in this view. If I go through and click on them, I can start to see really quickly which ones are elements, that's the key source, and which ones are users. Uh, that parameter is also gray in Revit, which means it's a read-only, and it's not schedulable or usable in any other way. It's only generated once you go to annotate keynote and choose what kind of keynote you want. So once it's done, it's done. You can't really use it otherwise other than clicking on it and then busting people or whatever. So what we're able to do is we'll open up Dynamo. We'll go to the Manage tab. So Dynamo is relocated in the Manage tab for Revit 2017 and under the Visual Programming panel. Once again, I already have Dynamo open, so I'll just jump over and open it up. I always have Dynamo open already because it just takes a second to launch. Um, it's not so fun to have to wait for 30 seconds every time I launch Dynamo. So in this uh, workflow, I have some notes already built in. So I'm going to color code keynotes by source. It's really good to note your Dynamo graphs. Uh, you can generate these little gray boxes by pressing Control w and typing a note, uh, some data here. That way you're starting to let people know what's going on in your graph. In addition to that, you can hold down Control and copy them, highlight them, right click, create group, and start to group them as well for information for people. Uh, you double click to edit the titles, so notes here and you can change colors and font size. So I've seen a lot of people have the colors mean something like input, output, ignore this, stuff like that. It's also nice to build in where what package a workflow depends on so that way people can start to figure out what's going on. So what we're going to go ahead and do is we need to kind of plan out our Dynamo graph and think in a kind of logical way. So what we want to do essentially is collect our keynotes and get that grayed out parameter. So this is kind of a pretty, I made this example pretty simple on purpose. That way we can work through it. So what I'll do is I'll jump back to Dynamo and we have to think of ways to collect things. So I want to work with keynote tags. So keynote tags are a category in Revit. In Dynamo I have my canvas, which is right in the middle of my screen, and my node library. So in the node library you have a bunch of built-in ones, but you also have a bunch of ones that you can install through the package manager, which is under packages, search for package. 
What we're going to do is navigate to Revit. We're going to navigate to Selection, because I want to select some stuff. And I should be able to find a node called Categories, which is right here. Once I place that node on my canvas by clicking it, I can now drag it around. So this node, or box, or whatever you want to call it, represents lines of code in the Revit API. In my case, I want to go ahead and use Keynote Tags. So what I can do is click on this dropdown, search for Keynote Tags, and I've now selected a category. Currently it says Null because I don't have Dynamo running actively on my document, but I can change that in this bottom corner of the screen by switching it to Automatic. So now what Dynamo will do is it will continue running each time I make a change. So it's listening for a moment in Revit when it can go ahead and run. So, so far I've got, I've selected the category that I want to work with. In Revit, keynotes are what we call view specific. So they only happen in the view that they're in, um, unless it's a dependent view of like a floor plan. But they're view specific, so that way they only exist in this view. So what we could do is I can use that to my advantage. So luckily, since there is an awesome Dynamo community, I can get something that is view dependent. That's available through a package called Clockwork. So if I expand the Clockwork bin, go to Revit, Selection, I think it's under Collector, all view dependent family instances of category. So what this node does is it's going to ask me for some inputs and it's going to output the stuff only in that view. In my case, keynote tags. So once again in Dynamo, I can tie some nodes together, so start to string these lines of code together so that way they flow. This node for categories outputs a category. This node needs a category, and I can see that on the first option. So category, and then for view. So I need to tell Dynamo what view I'm working with. Uh, we can search up here in the library, or I can right-click and search. So if I do active view, because we're going to only work in my active view. If I click active view, this is an out of the box node. It's looking for a document as well. So the out of the box nodes also include a document node. That's a few too many steps for me though. So I'm gonna go ahead and right click and search for active view and use the awesome node from a package called spring nodes. Spring nodes is another great one to have and it takes a few steps out for me, which is really cool. So now what I can do is this outputs a view. So in our case, section view, detail at parapet. That's reiterated right here. I can put that view output into my view input. The node hasn't quite done anything yet. Um, well, actually, that's a refresh. So I went ahead and ran. So if I need it to rerun, I can trigger the toggle with an input. So it ran, and it collected keynote tags in my view. Another cool thing to do is these little green boxes represent the element ID. So if I click on them, it'll actually kind of take me to a view to see those element IDs. So that's something else Dynamo offers as well. So what we want to do is we want to get that value of key source. The parameter name is actually key source, capital K, capital S, because capitalization is important with Dynamo. So what we can do is start to get those values to work with them. So another thing that I'll point out is this is an indented list. So on my screen, we could see that there's this zero right here. That means that the, the list is nested in one more level. I won't get into that a lot. Um, but what we will do is just go ahead and search for a node called flatten and flatten this list out. So now I don't have that pesky indentation happening, which is good. From there, I'm able to work with the values. So if you've ever watched any AU course on Dynamo, a node they most typically cover is getting parameter value by name. I use this node probably every single day. It's one of the most important nodes in Dynamo. So what it's looking for is an element input. Right here I have elements. And it's looking for the name of the parameter. Once again, that was key source with a capital K and S. So we need to input that name of that parameter somehow. Uh, that's achieved through what is called a string. And we can see that right here on the input. It tells us what the data type is. So if I right click, I can search for a string. 
and type in key source. Once again, that right click search takes a little too long, so I don't want to do that. I'm going to delete it. If you double click on the canvas, put a quote, and type in key source, this says code block. For now, I'm just using it as a string entry, though. There's no reason why I can't just use this like this, and it's a lot faster. Another good thing with code blocks is being able to add some notes to your code. So this is the param I want. So I put a note in there as well to let people know what I'm doing. If I tie that into parameter name, I can hover and pin it and start to see some output. So really quickly, I got all my keynotes in the view and I got all of the key sources from them. Just like that in what, three, four nodes? That's not bad at all. Um, on a lot of views, this could be scalable across a lot of views we can make that very automated and start to QA a set very well. So now we have element, user, and material. And that should be related back to what we had in here as well. So that's uh, really quickly getting those values. But what I want to do is organize them in a way to where I can color code them now. So one of my favorite nodes that I've, I've shown before, and I think everyone should know, uh, this is one thing I want you to take out of this webinar, it's this node. Grouping items by key. So if I right click and search for list group by key, all this really is, is it takes an input list and some shared criteria for keys and groups it based on that criteria. It's pretty awesome. So in our case, the shared criteria is this parameter that I'm using, so key source. And my elements will be the original keynotes. So if I go ahead, go ahead and put elements into list, and the parameter values into keys, Dynamo will think for a second and run. And we can see that I now have a grouping. So what it's doing is it's now grouping, we can kind of see both at once. It's grouping them by element, user, and material. So I can see that I have six element keynotes, three user keynotes, and two material keynotes. Really quickly, it's grouping it based on criteria Dynamo's doing that, and I'm not, and Dynamo's way faster than me, so that's pretty awesome, if you ask me. I'll go ahead and unpin that, and we'll work with it some more. What we're wanting to do is our end product is color coding this view based on those values. This is a keynote example, but it's scalable to any number of elements. I've used this for partitions, doors, anything like that. Luckily, Dynamo gives us the ability to override some colors. And if I find it, override color and view. So what this will do is just what it says. It's like right click override. That's what it's doing for you. So what it takes is a list of elements and some colors. So in Dynamo by default, if we do color, they offer this selection, color by ARGB. So what that means is if I want to get a color, I have to give it numerical values for each color. No, that's not very fun at all. Uh, luckily, there's a package called UI++, which lets us do a color picker, which is awesome. This is a custom node but made by Adam Sheather and Conrad Soban of the Bad Monkeys. That's their group name, and it's freely usable to everyone. That's pretty awesome, and we're going to use it. So what I'll do is I'll hold down Control to copy this node a few times, and then I'll look back at my original keys. So the good thing with the group by key node, I'll clean this up a little, is it outputs the keys in the order that they're being presented. So element, user, and material. At previous firms that I've worked with, um, I've noticed that element keynotes are kind of good. So green, good, good to go. User keynotes, not so good. We'll make those like a reddish. Um, the cool thing with the color pickers, you can actually kind of go into this cool interface too and make some cool stuff. So user keynotes, red, bad. Material keynotes, eh, they're fine, but I still want to see them, so I'll make that blue for now. One thing to keep in mind is you can have several outputs come from a node, but not several inputs. So if I tried to do this, it wouldn't take all of the colors that I want to use over that list. So in Dynamo, what I have to do is create another list from all these lists. It's a little weird to grasp at first, but once you get it, you can go with it. 
So I'll search for a list create node and it has some plus signs. So now I can make a list of all these colors. So now I see that reiterated in the output of the list create node. From here, all I need to do is apply those colors over the lists. That way I can see them in the view. And what I'll do is switch it to manual now because I don't want it to keep on running and overriding colors for me. I'll minimize just to kind of show that it's still black and then we'll go through a few more things. So my groups are my collections of elements. Those go into the element node. My color, if I were to plug this right in to the color, it would only override the first three elements, which isn't so fun. So luckily the Dynamo team gave us a way to handle this. It's called list at level. Uh, Marcelo and Colin just covered this really good on the Simply Complex podcast, how to use it. So I won't go super into detail. I suggest you listen to that. But what it does is it basically forces a list to come out and work over the rest. So in our case, we want to work at this level two area over the whole list with those colors. So what we could do is click this little arrow, tell it to use levels at level two, and we'll tell it to use some colors. I'll click run. It'll think for a moment. If I hover, I can see 11 things changed. I'll come back to Revit and I have all of my colors changed. This graph is now savable, reusable, and scalable to other things. So right away I can see which ones are my user keynotes, which ones are my element keynotes, and which ones are my material keynotes. That's an awesome workflow right out of Dynamo. What I wanna go ahead and do is I'll close this one for now. And I'll show a way to make this work through Dynamo Player, because that's great. We can open Dynamo, make it work. These are now red until someone clears the overrides. But using Dynamo Player could be so much more efficient. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and open my other graph for my Dynamo Player graph. And I'll show kind of a few of the other pieces of logic I use to make it work. So what's blue is different in this graph. So everything else is the same. Luckily, with Dynamo Player, so Dynamo Player by default doesn't support user interface interaction. It just runs and you're done. It doesn't give you any other kind of feedback, which is kind of, they're, they're gonna add it eventually. I'm very, I'm very sure of that, but it's kind of not the greatest thing. Uh, I've actually had someone run a graph without knowing what it, it did, and it was just running, and they're like, well, what's it doing? And it's like, well, it's renaming all your views. So adding a user interface is really important. Uh, luckily, through the awesome community, um, someone went through and made some awesome user inputs. So I'm able to do color specifications in a nice, slick pop-up. Uh, that user is Mustafa El Ayubi, and he, um, he blogs about all this on his blog, Data Shapes. And that's actually what this Dynamo package is called. Download it if you want to use Dynamo Player. Go download it right away. It's powerful. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and close this graph. We're going to open Dynamo Player from the same Manage tab. And I'll think for a second. And what this allows us to do is run Dynamo graphs in the background. So all we need to do is specify a folder to run from. In my case, it'll be over or color code keynotes. It'll show all the Dynamo graphs in that folder. So I always suggest people have a folder on their network for Dynamo graphs. And you can just run them by pressing a play button. That's so much more intuitive. If I click play on this last one, what it'll actually do is it'll think for a moment. It's running Dynamo in the background for me. And on the first run, it always takes a little bit longer. But it's running in the background, and it'll ask me if I want to reset the overrides in this view. I'll click set values, and now they're all black again. Cool, so now I have a reset override tool, which is basically like an add-in. If I hit play on the other one, this one brings up a user interface that's very similar for me to select colors. So I'll select an element color. In our case, this is green. I'll select a user color. Once again, I'll use red. And I'll use like a purple for the material color. Once I click set values, it runs in the background really fast and now I have this cool user interface for that same workflow. I basically just made a Revit add-in. That's pretty cool. So I hope that's helpful for the first example. I'll go ahead and get this closed and open up my next example. 
I don't know if there's any questions popping up or not, but if there is, just let me know. And I'll yeah, get John, my other so, example um, loaded. Yeah, so while you're um, getting your other example, we do have just a few questions. Um, one question um, came and wanted to know, regarding the um, Dynamo uh, add-in, is it version specific? Um, so like if you build it for, say, Dynamo, and you're using 2017, can you use that same script in 2015? Yeah, um, so with Dynamo, we have different versions. Uh, they release it, they release two things. They release daily builds, which change each day, and they release stable builds. Generally, Dynamo builds will stay compatible with each other across Revit versions, uh, unless you use something new that wasn't there before. So these workflows I'm making right now will actually work in Revit 16 as well. Um, in this example. I think it'll even work in Revit 15. But yeah, Dynamo is really beautiful too because it works across versions. That's good. Um, Cesar wanted to know uh, what is the, what is most of, most of package called again? Mustafa package oh. called again? I'm not sure if I'm not right. Yeah. So what you need to do is, uh, so on the package manager on my screen, search for data shapes, upvote it first of all, and download it. <laughs> so get that one right away. Uh, on his blog, he actually, he tells how to use all the nodes because there's some setup required. Um, but man, it's useful. So he has a bunch on here for creating these nice uh, UIs as well. Good. Uh, Adam wants to know, is Dynamo Player not out of the box in 2017? That's a good question. Yeah, so uh, with uh, Revit, and I'll go to, I'll just hover on my toolbar. So Revit, um, they have like that mid-year update. So Dynamo Player came with Revit 2017.1. That was released about October, November. So uh, if you don't have it right now, go get your update, run it, and then you'll have it. Good. Um, Adam wants to know what package is the color node from? The color node was an out-of-the-box node. Yeah, so uh, that override color in view, uh, and I think it's in, eh, I'll have to just search for it, override color. It's a Revit override on elements. So if I search for it, it'll tell me it's in the core library. So Revit, elements, okay. element. I think it's in here under override color. There it is. Uh, so Adam says, no, the color picker. Oh, color picker. That one's from a package called UI++. So if I do UI++, it's that one. I also have a few color question. pickers as well. Um, I have a few different options in, um, in rhythm. So like, I think I have rhythm.colorpicker. I can't remember what I named the darn thing. Yeah, so UI color picker, it'll actually pop up the native Revit color picker. So this is Revit Elements um, from Revit 2017 and on. So they added that in Revit 2017. So I bundled it into Rhythm. Good, um, we have two more questions. Alvaro asks, can you use the same approach to change the parameters meaning the pop-up window allows you to select colors. Could you change parameters in the same way? Definitely. So uh, that data shapes package offers the ability to specify text input as well. So you can use text input for set all of these parameters to this. Um, I saw someone yesterday setting prefixes on their room names with that workflow. So yeah, you just got to you just got to put all the inputs in. Okay. Um, Amer ask, um, how can I make these Dynamo plugin dialog boxes, and how is this based on something based on the Mustafa's work? I saw the buzz about it on Twitter, but I couldn't find it. Yeah, so uh, it's through his, uh, through his blog, so Data Shapes, um, that's where he'll document some of them, and I can open it up one more time. So he'll document them uh, and kind of tell you how to build it. The way that it's built, it, it takes a little understanding, uh, preparing for this presentation, I actually kind of had to teach myself it too, but what we'll do is open it. It's on manual. What he has in data shapes, he has UI, 
he has a whole lot of a whole lot of options in here. So and I actually minimized it. But what we have is different inputs, and then we have this this item that collects those inputs. So on my screen right now, I'm giving it three color input options, creating the list and putting them into inputs. The more that you put in there, the more inputs you're going to get. So if I were to keep on going and hit run, now I have six inputs. So the you keep giving, and I'm pointing at the screen like everyone can see it, you keep giving this one inputs and you'll be able to keep on building that form. Good. So we have about 23 more minutes left, um, and we got about four or five more questions that came up. I want to defer to you, John. Um, do you have enough time to go through your other examples? Or um, what we'll do is we can continue. Like after it's done, we can take more questions towards the end. Or John, if you feel confident, I can keep uh, firing questions. But it's up to you. What are you thinking? Uh, is the nature of the questions re relating to the first example more? Yeah. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and go through a few more. The next example is probably okay. like a 10 minute example because it's literally just a tool I built um, that I'll show. Okay. Um, so I'll ask Alex is at the end. Um, that's my good friend, Alex. Um, he said that he can wait. So Brian Juge is also a good friend of mine uh, for the color blind. Can you change fonts with bold text and red? So change actual text items in Revit. Is that what we're so thinking? saying for the color? I think so. He says for the colorblind, can you change fonts with bold text in red? Yeah. Let's see. You should be if you could do it in. So let's just go over that. If you could do it in Revit through a UI. So I'm right now I'm just over like uh, overwriting this to be a red font. Short answer, yes, you can do it in Dynamo. <laughs> okay. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and we'll go on to the next session um, or the next example, if that's all right. Okay. Cool. Yep. So this keep one. Keep on coming. Yeah, definitely. That's exciting. I, I like that everyone has questions. That's awesome. So this example, on my sheet, I just have a whole lot of elevation views. And I should have thick lines turned on. I've seen people who want to frame these elevations uh, for print to be really bold and readable and legible because it mounts them on the sheet well. Uh, the way to do that is you right click inside of the view, you right click on the viewport, you override it to whatever, and then you jump out and keep on going. That's manual and that sucks. So I'll undo that. I've also seen people do it with masking regions, which is terrifying. Um, so I thought there has to be a way to do this in Dynamo. There has to be to get those crop regions and work with them, right? Uh, so what we're able to do, let me jump over to this. So what we're able to do is we're able to collect all of our elevation views based on a criteria. In my case, any elevation that has the word interior in it, I'm going to collect an override and apply some overrides to it. Uh, this one I kind of mentioned, it's a shorter workflow because it's literally, and I'll turn it on manual for now. It's literally a tool I have bundled in Rhythm. So if I search for override interior crop, it's going to override interior crop regions based on a line weight and what the name contains. In this case, I gave it a default value of interior, so we don't have to put anything into that first port. All we need to do is specify a line weight and we can run it. One really cool thing that uh, after a lot of working through it uh, with people on the forum, we had a lot of ideas to collect that crop region, which is kind of a hard element to select in Revit. Uh, if you click on a crop region, you'll see that it's called a view in Revit. If you try to override a view with colors and all that stuff, it doesn't work so well. So that was kind of a nightmare. After a lot of a lot of stress in figuring it out. I finally discovered that a viewport of a view is literally the element ID of the view, so it's unique, it's element ID in Revit minus one. That way the crop region's relatable to the view very quickly. So all we're doing is getting the views ID 
subtracting one, and then grabbing the element with that subtracted ID. When I found this out, it was like a revelation. I was like, oh my gosh, that's all we had to do all along. Before we were doing like collections of stuff in views. Is it a viewport? Does it belong to that view? It was a nightmare. So minus one, minus one did. So what we'll do is we'll drop a slider in, and in this case, I'm going to go ahead and use an integer slider, whole numbers, because uh, you can't really do a line width that's 1.5. I'll do 1 to 16, which are the array of line weights that we have to choose from in Revit. What I'm going to do also is tile my window so that we can kind of see this magic happen before our eyes. So all I need to do is put line weight into line weight, and run me is a toggle that I built in to prevent it from running unless you want it to. What it takes is a Boolean, which is a yes, no, or true, false value, and then it'll run. In addition to this, I'll go ahead and turn it on automatic run mode. That way it's running each time I make a change. We can see it completed. It doesn't look like anything happened quite yet. But what I'll do is start dragging this slider, and we should start to see something really fun happen. So across my entire project, every elevation that has the word interior in it is updating. That saves so much time, and it's so efficient. That's, that's a great workflow, in my opinion. When I, when I figured this out, I was like, oh, man, this is great. So as I slide it, it'll just keep updating. Uh, next, so I I'll go ahead. This is huge. Yeah. Sorry, John, not to interrupt you. This is huge. Um, <laughs> so I worked with firms before, and I don't know, you guys are probably familiar with like the donut, we call it the donut method, where you put in the stupid masking region um, <laughs> that you try to overlay on top of these views, and I've seen people spend hours putting in these stupid masking regions just because they weren't happy with like the line weight of that crop boundary, um, so the fact, and like how fast, you know, you were able to do this, it's just like <laughs> mind blown, this is awesome, so really good stuff, keep going. And and this is one, like, in the process, I discovered all those little workarounds. So I was like, oh, this has to go out to the world. People need to use this. So that's, why it's, <laughs> that's why it's in Rhythm as a, as a tool uh, for free from the goodness of my heart. So it's all out there. What we'll do next is we'll, um, we'll make it work in Dynamo Player, actually, which is even cooler. Uh, so another thing to make note of is Dynamo will actually offer you some undos um, for each time it ran. So every time I slid that slider, it was running. Uh, that's how we got that interface. Uh, I'll just undo back. It'll think for a minute. We should have some not overridden crop regions. So what we'll do now is open up Dynamo Player and navigate to another portion of the script, and I'll open it first, that I modified to have a nice pop-up that I built for, for use with Dynamo Player. So what we'll do is we'll select overread crop regions. I have one called player for Dynamo Player. I'll open it to show everyone kind of what's, uh, what's inside of this thing. So once again, we're in Dynamo. So what we have is I have a yes, no toggle built into Rhythm now. Um, and I also have an integer slider. So what this is going to do is have a user interface that tells people what this workflow is doing and they can say no if they change their mind. So if I hit play, Dynamo Player, will, uh, it'll run in the background, it'll run Dynamo, kind of, it's very similar to a Revit add-in, which I really like. Um, on first run, once again, it takes a second, but we get this nice pop-up. So this pop-up says, override interior crop regions. This workflow will do the following. Ask you for a line style, 1 through 16, and it'll override the crop regions that have the word interior in the elevation name. Do you want to continue, yes or no? If you click no, nothing. It goes back, you took whatever pills for no, and everything goes back to normal. But let's say you want to run it. If I click play, I'll click yes now. I get this nice little slider. So this slider is compatible with Dynamo Player, and you're able to specify minimum and maximum values. So I'll go extreme and make it 16, hit upset, accept. I now ran that graph through Dynamo Player, very much like an add-in for people to use and I override all of those crop regions on those views on my sheet, just like that. That's really useful. Um, Dynamo player fight even, so that's kind of that example as well. So if there's more questions, we can look at them. I have one more backup example that I won't work through, so if there's time, I'll go through it too. 
Yes, definitely. So Mike wants to know, what if the frame isn't a pure rectangle? Um, we're kind of controlled, constrained by what Autodesk kind of gives us, right? Is the rectangle, what do you do if it's not, if you don't want a rectangle? So if you modified your viewport, let's see, edit crop, and actually, so if I edit my crop region and kind of do something else, I'm going to go ahead and try this live even though I don't know what will happen. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what we'll do is I'll run it through player. That's a modified crop region. I'll change it to 16. Cool. So if you oh. modified your crop region, it'll work. <laughs> so, whew, thank goodness. That's awesome. <laughs> That's great. Uh, and then I actually know... read it in the view. I didn't even know that. Oh, yeah. That's cool. Um, Dave wants to know, have you found a way to move the view title? And then he says in parentheses, the bubble, like the, the call-out bubble there. Have you found a way to move that? Um, and and I'm, I'm guessing maybe his question is, like, in regards to, like, how it – maybe that. I was thinking, like, if it was for the line, maybe he can unpack that a little bit. But he was wondering – if you can move them, guessing you can, if you're able to get to the element ID or the uh, grab it by view title and move it, or if he's looking for the extent, um, maybe. Yeah, um, I would imagine you probably can. Right offhand, I've never messed with the view titles, so I can't directly say yes or no. Um, it's a Revit element, thankfully, so I imagine you can. Um, it requires some more investigation and maybe breaking down kind of what's needed a little more. Um, so yeah, like if I just select it, it shows up as a viewport, I bet, yeah. So we'd have to kind of figure out how to break that down some. So that's a, ideas like that are great too. So I am throw it on our forum or something and maybe we can look at it some more too. Definitely. And some other people are having some comments about that. It sounds like they've tried to experience it before and they said it's, it's not accessible via the Revit API, at least last time they checked. So. Um, to, okay. to John's point, not to step ahead too much, but we do have a forum that we're going to talk about. So if you guys have other questions beyond just this webinar, the, our forum at evolvedin.com is a great place um, to ask a lot of these questions. Um, so Jason says it'd be nice to automatically adjust the view title line to match the length of the view title text. Um, let's see, I had another one, sorry. Uh, oh, yeah, is rhythm... Someone asked, sorry, it jumps here. Is a rhythm uh, grouping available uh, for, is that rhythm grouping available for free? Yeah, so rhythm's and a... I think you, answered that. It's, it's, you said it's out of the goodness of your heart. You shared that with uh, <laughs> every, anybody that wants to have it, correct? Yeah, so um, I don't think I've really seen a paid Dynamo package, but on dynamopackages.com, um, there's a bunch of them. Rhythm's free. It's right here. This is mine. I built it. Um, so what happened is I learned Dynamo at AU 2014 from Marcelo's uh, classes. So shout out to Marcelo. I learned it. In, yeah. At, <laughs> I learned it at AU 2014, and I started building things. And I was like, well, these are pretty neat workflows. I want to share them with people. So I, I went ahead and published it all in this package. It's named Rhythm because you maintain your, your rhythm with Revit and Dynamo. Uh, my first note I made was getting an elements category. It's so simple. It was literally select the element, get the category from it, and output the category. But man, that was the first note, and it just took off, and I started building a lot of stuff from it. So that's available for anyone to get. Um, any of the ones in this top most installed list, go get them. Go get them right away. They should be installed on your machine always. Um, but yeah. it's good. Um, this is a really good question, I think, especially for those that are just starting to get into Revit. Uh, Adri uh, Ari Ariadna wants to know, how did you get the element ID? Um, I think yeah. that's pretty critical, like when you're working with Dynamo, how, how do you get the element ID? Yeah, so if I... Um, Dynamo has a nice uh, selector just called view, so I'll just select the view for now. Um, these are all the views in my project. If I right-click and search for element.id, there's a few options, one of which is a built-in node. It'll output the element ID just by putting the element into the input. So I use this node. Uh, when I subtracted one from it, so like I think a better example would be grab an elevation. Minus one, uh, minus. So from there, I'm oh, able so to work with this. 
So they're actually clarifying, sorry, they're saying, um, no, it, they said it's getting element ID and subtracting one to get the crop that he was asking about. So his question was, like, how did you find that out? Like, does that <laughs> yeah, give you access to the crop? Out, yeah. Could you change exactly. the crop dimension adapt to the walls through there? Um, so that was kind of the more crux of this question. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, so uh, what I actually did to break down and get that correlation of minus one for the element ID is I went into a view finally and I was like, what is this element? What is a crop region already? I selected it in Revit. <laughs> in Dynamo, Spring Nodes has a cool node called collector.current selection, which will actually grab what your current selection is in Revit, in Revit and output it for you. From there, I just kind of visibly saw all oh, my views three four five seven three four, and my crop regions three four five seven three three. There's a correlation there, and I tried it, and it worked. So uh, that's kind of a peek into my mind. I sometimes dream about this stuff too. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, another question came up: Is how much of the Revit API structure do you recommend knowing before you try to build your own custom node? Seems pretty vital, but it's hard to find a good resource um, out there. So, how much of the uh, Revit API structure do you recommend knowing before building your custom node? Uh, my answer is it just kind of depends on what you want to do. Um, let's see. Like I said, and, the and, first. And, yeah. and tied to that, someone else was asking, like, how did, how did you learn to work with the Revit API syntax? So, I think the, the questions are kind of correlated. Like, is, are there some resources? of like how you can start to be able to call some of these things out from the Revit API. I know some of these are more technical, but two people yeah. are asking, so I think there's a want to know. Okay. So the answer for developing custom packages, it depends on what you want to do. When I originally built uh, Rhythm, I set out to build stuff that's doable with out-of-the-box nodes only, even if it took a little longer. This node's a little crazier than I thought it was. But all I'm doing is getting all the parameters, finding which one contains a category, and splitting it up. This was my first node. Um, so this didn't involve any Revit API that I had to know. All I had to do was go through Dynamo and start messing with stuff. For stuff that actually deals with the Revit API, so like using Python and the Revit API, I suggest going onto a website. Uh, it's a... It's kind of difficult. Normally, uh, my thought process, like when I want to do something, uh, one that I was just doing was if I want to do something in the Rev API, I need to start researching it. So it's like split bases of walls Revit API. Most often, you're going to get to the Revit API forums or the building coder, which is awesome. He's a great person. You can get in there, Definitely. and he'll kind of start to break down some of the stuff you need to do. This split faces one's not possible, unfortunately. So once I found that out, I was like, oh, well, crap. But he'll start to break it down. From there, it'll list some of the API calls that you need to do. I don't have a great answer for how to learn those. Uh, the way I started to break down Python and figure it out was this package right here, Clockwork, and Archilab Grimshaw. These guys are awesome. Um, they have a lot of stuff in there that helps you learn what to do. So like if I search for one right offhand, element type, this is the first node that I broke down to figure out what it does. If you double click in the node, when it's stacked, it's a custom node. If you double click in there, you'll notice this is where all the good stuff happens, Python. If I right click and click edit, it's pretty simple. But what he's doing is he's getting some items and applying an API method over that list and outputting some values. Conrad has some really great courses on starting to use Python and C-sharp and Dynamo uh, through Think Parametric. Uh, it's, I don't have a great answer. I'm still learning how to program myself. I started using Dynamo as someone who had limited experience in programming. I, um, I knew HTML from high school, I think. I think that's my, my, my programming portfolio before Dynamo. Um, but if you're interested in it, just keep diving into it. Um, the Building Coder has great sources. Um, Booster BIM has great resources. There's a lot of good stuff out there, uh, blogs. Um, it's kind of a big answer, but that's the best I have. <laughs> that's good. 
Maybe, John, can you open up um, the forum that we just launched so people know, like, there's a resource there um, for these type of questions, too, to kind of show them? Because we're kind of rounding out here, but I want to let you guys know as you guys continue having some of these uh, questions as the day progresses after this, if you guys do go to our website, evolvebin.com, um, we have a community forum that we've launched. It's part of our membership to you guys. It's 100% free. Um, you can join. You can ask questions. You can chat about Dynamo, chat about Revit families. Um, and so it's a resource out there uh, that we may have a few answers. Other people in the forum might have some answers. So the idea is to try to kind of develop a community around some of this where people want to learn. Um, so we just launched that. Within there, we have custom scripts um, that we're constantly writing. John just uh, did this one, Printing from Dynamo. And so it's, it's a great resource for you guys if you guys want to start learning more about this. Additionally, we have some exclusive online training videos. Again, 100% free for you guys. You guys can bring it back to your firm. We talk about what's new in Revit 2017 or how to push Grasshopper geometry into Revit, building Revit families, adaptive components. Um, and so we're constantly adding to uh, this part of the website. This video here that we're doing is going to be recorded. It's going to be posted here. So if you want to bring that back to your office, it's available there. We're also putting up free add-ins. Um, we have some new add-ins that are coming out as well as like access to our newsletter. Um, there's just a ton of, and ton of opportunities that we're trying to give back to you guys. So if you want to sign up for the membership, again, totally free and hopefully it's a good resource for you guys. If you're looking at trying to take it to the next level, like say you want John to come into your firm and you guys want to do like a, a, a private Dynamo workshop, what we're doing is we're offering this new subscription, which is pretty cool, basically allows you guys to have direct access to us for whatever you want, uh, templates, standards, family building, computational design, facade, uh, Dynamo uh, workshops, Grasshopper workshops, Revit workshops. Um, this is something that we're offering um, to the community as well when you guys are ready to kind of take it to the next level. So just trying to be a resource for you guys. We know like going through a lot of this stuff is self-taught. It's searching through the forum. It's searching on Google. And not everyone has the, all the answers, but collectively, as a team, we, we feel like with you guys, your help, and us um, together, it's a win-win where we can kind of learn from each other and benefit each other. So that's really what we're striving for. It's kind of this community aspect of, of, of banding together and trying to find answers to a lot of these tough uh, questions. So I wanted to make sure that you guys knew that existed. Um, we're pushing up on 1 o'clock. If you guys want, we'll hang out for a few minutes. I think the webinar will not expire but we are recording this. We will put it up there. We really appreciate your guys' time and, and checking things out. Um, check us out. There's The Twitter handle is at evolve underscore lab. The website, evolvedem.com. You can check out John's personal blog there at 60 Second. Um, my webinar software. There we go. 60secondrevit.com or his Twitter handle is at 60 Second Revit. So we really appreciate you guys taking the time um, to attend today. It's so good to have you guys here. So check that out and enjoy the rest of your day, okay?